It's Freedom Files with James Burns. Welcome to the Freedom Files podcast for this Thursday, March 8th, 2012. I am James Burns. We are joined now by Bob Chapman. His website is theinternationalforecaster.com. Bob, how are you doing today, sir? Well, pretty good. There's a lot of issues going on right now across the country and the planet, and I decided I'm just going to let you have the ball and uh, tackle which one you think is most important right now. Well, I guess it's what... uh... 6 to 12 o'clock tomorrow, we're going to find out about the uh, <clears throat> the problem with uh, Greece and its uh, private owners of bonds and whether they're going to go agree to uh, continue to accept what Greece has decided to give, in, to give them. Uh, I guess it's about a 70% haircut on their bonds. And we don't have anything final on that yet, <clears throat> but uh, we're supposed to have it in the morning. And I don't know whether that's going to happen or not. That's pretty close. A lot of a lot of people waiting on that decision. Um, I think uh, the situation that borders the, the Greek affair is important as well. <clears throat> Last week the uh, judges, the federal judges in Kalsro, uh which is in Germany, uh, said that uh, they believe that the situation with uh, the Bundestag and the Bundeshat, uh was illegal, pertaining to <clears throat> the two methods of uh, sending money to the nations which have financial problems. It's called the EFSF, and its successor is going to be the ESM. He said you can't do that. So I don't know what Germany's going to do, because if they don't become part of that, then uh, there's a big problem. Nobody can give any money out. If they're not going to give money out, they usually give about 23 to 25 percent of the total. So I think that uh, that's a very important event. And then the Greeks got the payment coming up on two-year bonds um, on the 12th or the 20th. Then I guess something else going on on the 20th, and it's not good. And uh, there's a meeting at the end of April, which should be the 29th and 30th, uh, if I'm correct, um, the 29th and 30th will be to sort out any problems that they have during the situation that they're talking about with Greece and other things. Also, uh, the the appointed uh, leader of Greece, uh, he set the elections on the 29th of April, and they're supposed to be on the 4th. So you can see the alumnus are trying to gain time in case something goes wrong, uh, which is probably going to be the case. So Europe gets in trouble, and the whole world goes down financially. And so it's become a catalyst. And we don't know which thing, way things are going to go, And so, based on that, there could be some pretty bumpy roads ahead. And so, I think those are the most important things right now. What do you think? I think that the situation in Germany that you were just talking about is fascinating, Bob. This potential conflict over, you know, this money being spent. I mean, what what could be the fallout there in the, the German government over all this? Well, essentially what's happened is that um, they took their vote to assist these countries. And then 
the court team, and I think it was on Thursday, said, no, you can't do all that stuff. And Mrs. Merkel hasn't said anything. The media in Europe has swept it under the rug. Uh, they don't want anybody to know anything about anything. And uh, so it's uh, something that they got to make changes on. I don't know how they're going to do it. We'll have to find out. Yeah, but this could be, I mean, serious problems, though, for not just Germany, but for other countries as well. You're starting to see a growing amount of uh, dissent over the European Union. I mean, it's been happening for a while now, but over the past couple months, especially as things continue to get worse and worse debt-wise for all these countries you've mentioned, uh, Greece, Portugal, the, the list goes on and on. I mean, we could really see this coming to a head soon. I uh, could, but they'll search it out. Yeah, it'll take a while. I, I, I think the big question is, uh, is, uh, is uh, Greece going to default? And we just don't know. Uh, if they do, uh, then uh, Germany's got a problem. But so does everybody else in Europe. And that'll you know, extend outward to England and the United States. And um, there'll be all kinds of havoc. So uh, we're, we're at a precipitous, uh, precipitous, so to speak. Indeed. And another thing that you brought up that I, I thought was very disturbing is what's happening in Greece with the fact that they've moved back their elections for a couple months. And from everything you've been talking about, it seems pretty apparent that they don't want the changing of the guard to happen too soon in order for the thieves to get away with what they're doing. That's right. I like getting their hand on the gold that's over there. Now, it's just, it's just fascinating how this government takeover and these conflicts are happening in every single country, not just in Greece or Germany or throughout the European Union, but you see what's happening here in the States. I don't know if you uh, caught this yet, but Defense Secretary Panetta went before uh, the state, the Senate Armed Services Committee, and I came across this last night uh, when I was doing my radio show. And basically, he told, he told the Senate that international permission trumps uh, congressional permission when it comes to Syria and other uh, <laughs> national defense issues. I mean, this is a complete violation of the, uh, you know, the checks and balances system that we have and our Constitution. And they'll continue to do that and thumb their nose and your face. They just keep on going and doing what they're doing. They're Nazis. They're corporatist fascists. A whole bunch of them. And now everybody's in on it. Yeah. And, and what's and, funny and is... It, it's not going to be good for America, I'll tell you. And if none of the good guys get elected in the next election, you can be sure you're heaven headed for revolution. Well, Nobody you're wants to hear it. You're absolutely right about that scenario. We'll get to that in a moment. I mean... It's, it's funny, but yet it's sad at the same time. You, you have the Congress. They've gone in, becoming bought and paid for and corrupt, not serving the will of people anymore. But now they're getting stabbed in the back by, by the administration, by the military now, by the, the, the SecDef. They're, they're saying, hey, you're irrelevant. You don't count anymore. And that was, I mean, they pretty much proved that back in Libya. I mean, they went above the Congress. They said, no, I don't, you know, the president's like, I don't need Congress permission. I'm, I, I get my marching orders from the U.N. to, to do what we're doing in Libya. And the same thing is going to happen with Syria. Well, Syria is uh, probably going to fight to the last man. So the casualties uh, are going to be very, very heavy among NATO troops as well as U.S. And, of course, the U.S., Assad, the French are already in there. Illegally. They don't care. They do anything they want to do. And if, if they'll do that in a war with a foreign country that they've invaded, what do they think what do you think they're gonna to do to you? Something to think about, Americans. You're absolutely right about that, Bob. I mean <laughs> they they are definitely set the president, not not only for over the past decade alone now, and it goes further back, obviously, but all these police state actions in Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, now with their eyes on Syria, and with them continuing to strip away our freedoms and liberties at home, destroying the Constitution and Bill of Rights of every chance they get. You're right. What you said a moment ago, Bob, was nail on the head. If we don't start getting our people 
elected to office at all levels of government, in the Congress, in the Senate, at state houses, and local government, we're in serious trouble. And I don't think it's going to happen from what I'm seeing. The elections are being stolen. Nobody says anything. Next time around, no one will vote. Why bother? Yeah, that's what I'm beginning to wonder. I mean, all the time, you know, when I grew up, you know, and, you know, my dad and, uh, you know, my teachers in school said it's it's your duty as an American citizen to vote. If you don't vote, you don't have a voice. But if you take a look at these primaries and these caucuses and how most of them are being rigged, I mean, it's pretty apparent that, you know, those of us who are going out trying to change things for the good and peacefully, uh, our, our, our votes aren't counting anyways. It's wake up time. Definitely. And that's the problem. Because as you and I both know, Bob, the majority of the American people are still asleep. Despite everything that's going on in this country and around the world, most of them care more about American Idol, baseball season coming up, and who knows what else, to even bother to lift a finger to do anything. And you know, we're reaching millions of people. Still not enough. I know. It's sad. Well, they'll wake up, you know, a year or so from now, maybe two. And uh, the Navy gets carted off in the middle of the night because he said nasty things about the president, and uh, he'll never be heard from again. That's what's sad. A lot of the people are going to wake up eventually. It's only a matter of time. But the problem is a lot of them are going to wake up when it's basically too late. It's almost too late. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's becoming more and more apparent with each passing day. And then I just came across this a, a few minutes ago before the show. I mean, not only is you know, the EU having debt problems in Greece and other countries, but, I mean, look at our debt problem. It's huge. And uh, the Washington Post is reporting that the federal government set the worst record deficit in February of month-wise. In uh, February 2011, it was $223 billion. Last month, it was $229 million, billion dollars, Bob. I mean... That's insane. We are borrowing 42 cents of every dollar that is spent over the, the first five months of this fiscal year already. And it's only March. They don't care. We're going to spend and spend until I can't anymore. Then the system will come down. And then when it does, we'll have to move on them, won't we? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I just it's just amazing. I mean, you had Bernanke, what, a week or so ago. Uh, talking about how we're going to have to dump more more cash into the into the uh, economy, which means inflation, which means the dollar is going to continue to deteriorate in value, and and now we're we're borrowing nearly, uh, it, it's getting close and close to fifty cents out of every dollar, and eventually, I, I mean, I know that this might be a, going a bit too far in the comparison, and uh, feel free and correct me if I'm wrong, Bob, but. Is it possible that, that the dollar could eventually go the way of the, the Weimar mar mark in uh, value? It could. Uh, one of the uh, erroneous uh, comparisons that people make is currencies versus currencies. I mean, they're all bad. You've got to measure uh, currencies versus gold and silver. It's the only true way to do it. I mean, does anybody really think that the U.S. dollar or the euro – a strong, a viable currencies? I don't think so. No, what they're doing, I mean, they just, Fed Reserve just uh, lent uh, $1.4 trillion to the European Central Bank. That'll last probably a year and a half. They'll do another 1.4. And a good part of that money will be monetized, causing inflation. That's just a, a continuation of things going, you know, from bad to worse to nightmare. Bob Chapman is my guest. His website is theinternationalforecaster.com. And you, know, you spoke a moment ago about you know this, this election cycle and how it's really, really turning bad. I mean, it's obvious, very apparent. While at the same time, I, I find it, uh, we'll, we'll just use the word you used a moment ago, erroneous, that you know, we have the U.S. attacking Russia over their election, yet what about our elections going on here? Well, the Russians are the good guys. I mean, why think that they're anything else? I don't see them again their elections like that. Oh, I'm sure that things go on that shouldn't in all countries, but they don't like Putin because they can't control him. 
I don't know for sure, but I'm told by people who are on the inside that Putin uh, and, and China both will not take orders from the New World Order. Now, that's very interesting. Now, what are we going to do, have another war and draft American boys and girls to go fight against Russia or China that didn't do anything? Now, it's, it's a very alarming predicament that we have here. And you see what's happening with Iran and Syria. The West is provoking military action on both fronts. And yet on the other side, you have China and Russia both going backbound saying, hey, wait a minute. No, no, no. Th- this will not stand. Or, you know, we're not going to have this. You know, they're, they're standing up in the, the uh, U.N. They're, they're speaking out openly against this. And they're saying, look, any attack on Iran, Pakistan, or Syria is going to be met with response. And you're right, Bob. I, I think we are heading towards a very real possibility of a third world war. Well, I think you're right, and uh, the quality today of weaponry is pretty good uh, in those countries, uh, as good as American equipment, and uh, I think the casualties are going to be extraordinarily high. Well, I I think so too, Bob. I mean, this isn't the same Russia that was crumbling in the early 90s. I mean, Russia has been rebuilding so has china i mean these are you know these are they may not be at the same level of superpower as the u.s is but you know our military power and status is waning in the world as we continue to stretch ourselves thinner and thinner with all these liberations or occupations or police actions whatever you want to call them and it it's a dangerous precedent that the neocons and the those that support the military and you know industrial complexes war machine is is setting us on well i think from their point of view it would be nice if they had conflict drafted people get all the young people out of the country along with the military and then try to bring in foreign troops i don't think they'd win uh but they could do that i mean i wouldn't be a want, want to be a foreign troop going in the united states because they know darn right well they're not going to win, and there'll be no prisoners taken. Nah, I, mean, I don't it, think it that's be... any very envious for some German or Japanese or whatever. I wouldn't want to face an insurgent group of people who are armed to the teeth. Not at all. And I think, honestly, most foreigners in other countries, uh, if they were asked, hey, would you like to uh, pack up your bags and – and go off to uh, America, they would probably say, no, I think I want to stay in my country instead. I don't want to go off into a foreign land and end up being blown up or shot or captured and having who knows what done to me. Well, I think you're right. Yeah, I mean, it's just a, it's just a sad situation that we have. I mean, this continues to deteriorate, and it just doesn't seem like there's any end. It, you think sooner or later, Bob, that we'd get to the point where somebody would actually hit the brakes, <laughs> you know, just slam on the brakes saying, wait a minute, maybe maybe we're going a little too far here. Maybe we're, we're taking this uh, too close to, as you mentioned a moment ago, the precipice, the, you know, <laughs> going past the line and tumbling down into this abyss. And, you know, it, there is a good thing. You know, most Americans are anti-war now. They, they want our troops home. They, they want to stop this aggressive police action but unfortunately we have too many people in our government election elected officials and bureaucrats bought and paid for and they're going to continue business as usual well i think they're going to have a problem sooner or later one that's not going to be easily easily fixed what are they going to do and bring in foreign troops and these uh, families of people who are hiding out from the public? Do they really think they're going to get away? I mean, do they really think that there's going to be prisoners taken? you got to be kidding me. They think it's some kind of a game. And it's not. No, I mean, this is definitely not a game. I mean, this is a very serious situation. And it's no reason that 
the, you know, the Congress and the government and the president all have very, very low approval numbers. Meanwhile, the unemployment is continuing to go up. I mean, they're saying right now it's at 9.1 percent. But, Bob, you know full well that that number is a conservative number at best. It's much higher. I mean, nothing's getting better. I mean, it's, it's continuing to get worse and worse. And uh, I had an interview today with somebody in Germany. And they said, well, things are going okay for us, but generally speaking, things aren't all that well or what they should be. And um, unemployment, the, 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 the figures in Europe are not correct. They're fudge like everybody else's are. And um, it's just not a good situation. It's it's deteriorating. And the banks who borrowed all that money, 800 of them. Can you imagine 800 banks being in trouble? And they're going to, uh, <clears throat> they're going to have to lend money to business for expansion and inventory and cash flow and so on. And they're not doing it. Now, how do they expect unemployment to improve? And same thing in America. England, last week they said, we're bankrupt. I don't have any more money. Now, that's not very good. So you have social problems inside these countries. Unemployment's 25% in Spain. Almost every country, including the United States, unemployment among the young is over 50%. I mean, what do they do when their families can't feed them anymore? Do they become outlanders and criminals? Probably. We don't know. We haven't got there yet. But if you look at history, desperate people do desperate things. That's exactly right. I mean, all you have to do to, to learn exactly where we're going is look at the past. Look at what happened in similar situations in other tough economic times when normal people – lost everything they lost their job they lost their homes they lost their you know basically the lives that they knew and they they see their families starving to death and unfortunately good people in times like that kick into survival mode they they do things that they never thought that they would do in order to ensure that they and their family survives and that means breaking a whole lot of laws and possibly you know leading towards conflict with their fellow ma fellow man and then you've got gangs throughout the United States today, which I don't know that any other country has to the degree America has. And these people are heavily armed, and they're animals. You know, what is one to do? You're sitting in your house, and somebody comes up uh, with an AK-47 and says, look, whatever you got, we want it. If you don't have a gun, you're screwed. I mean, that's a very dangerous scenario that you're talking about because it's very possible with an economic collapse that you're going to see the gangs become like wolf packs. They're going to go from neighborhood to neighborhood, raiding people's houses, doing whatever they want because they're going to be the, the, the authority, and they're going to have carte blanche to, uh, <laughs> well, wipe the floor of you if you get in their way, if you try to stop them because there isn't no police coming. There's nobody coming to save you. The only person that can save you is yourself. And that's one of the reasons why I'm a big advocate for people owning Second Amendment devices and learning how to properly use them and defend themselves against any potential intruder, whether they're you know, a robber or you know, in a scenario like this. Well, I felt that way all my life. And uh, if you want to die, you came to the right place. Yeah, I mean, it's it's funny, Bob, because all over my house and, and on the front yard, in the backyard, I have these uh, fake-looking uh, blue octagon stickers that look like a Brink security stickers, but it's actually a pistol, and it says, this home protected by Second Amendment security. Uh, and you know, that's very effective because uh, people who want to commit crime, and we'll call it crime, uh, they see that and they say, ah, Maybe we should go to the house next door. 
Exactly. Plus, it doesn't hurt to have a nice big dog either because I also have warning signs about my dog, you know, warning beware of dog. <laughs> that kind of helps too psychologically, you know, if a potential criminal is saying, well, maybe maybe I shouldn't break into this guy's house. Now you're going to put a sign out. He's been trained to eat human flesh. <laughs> Fido is hungry. Please enter. Uh, okay, we're getting, we're getting a little carried away. Okay, Bob Chapman is my guest. His website, theinternationalforecaster.com. I mean, I mean, it's always been my philosophy. No matter how dark things get, if you if you don't have a sense of humor, you really are going to lose it. So I mean, it doesn't hurt to laugh sometimes. But I mean, this is a serious you know situation we're talking about because the government's getting worse. I mean, they're getting out of control. I mean, they're about to pass this new law, Bob. I don't know if you heard about it. Uh, I think it's a uh, what. 347, I think, is this trespass bill, and it's basically going to make the First Amendment illegal. And this thing just flew through Congress over over the past couple of days. It, it makes it to where protesting in front of government buildings or if there's a, a government official like the president or, say, a, you know, a Secret Service officer in the vicinity of a protest, you can be federally arrested for it. That could be a federal crime now. I mean, th these people have no regard for our rights. I mean, to them, we don't have any anymore. I was just thinking uh, when I began to realize when I went to work for the government in counterintelligence that the mafia were the good guys and I was working for the bad guys on a scale of 10, 10 being worst. The situation was probably a 2. And now it's an 8. It's going to be very interesting whom uh, you pick up with in order to defend yourself. And as you said earlier in the conversation, the police would just dis disappear. I mean, they're all gunned and uh, they're all manned. They, they face the same situation as a foreign army called in to quiet the American demonstrators or something. Yeah, and the reality of the situation is police are, are people too, and they have families, and when it hits the fan, who are they going to worry more about? Uh, the, the average citizen or their own wife and kids at home? They're going to go home, and they're going to protect their children. And no one can blame them for that. Yeah, but but I mean, it, uh, it, go ahead. No, yeah, go ahead, Bob. Now, there will be those who stay and uh, act in behalf of the federal government. And they just get annihilated. And, you know, the police are very well aware of this. You know, take your choice. You know, they run around with all this armor on. When you shoot somebody in the head, you shoot them in the head. And you just direct your people, headshots only. I don't think there's any recovery from that. No, I mean, it, the reality of the situation is, I mean, you've seen this time and time again throughout history, all these different armies and soldiers and armor. I mean, look how well the, the, the knights were armored in the Crusades, but that didn't, that didn't stop them from being slaughtered. I mean, all that in the world won't stop somebody from killing you if they want to kill you. And there's always a weak spot. I mean, if you aim at somebody's uh, leg and, you know, hit an artery, you're going to bleed out. You're going to die. So, I mean... It's just an exercise in futility to try and think that, oh, if I wear all this armor and look all intimidating uh, as a stormtrooper, no one's going to mess with me and nobody can kill me. I'm invincible. No, you're not invincible. They'll probably send drones after you. I mean, that, that's probably the very real likelihood. I mean, especially with what a couple of weeks ago the FAA approved, what, 30,000 drones to be flown over the U.S. by 2020? <laughs> I mean, it's unbelievable. They, I know it's, and and you see what's happening in Pakistan and Yemen over over these other countries. At first, they they brought them out. Oh, we're using these to to find terrorists and Al Qaeda camps. Now they're being used to kill people. Indiscriminately. Yeah, and and, it, and what's really sad is that the people that are flying these drones, these these young men and women. They they have no real emotional attachment to what they're doing. They're not in the cockpit. They're not up there 
they, they've been programmed to believe that, hey, you know, this is a video game. Hey, this is fun. Oh, I'm going to get some points. I'm going to get some achievement trophies. I'm going to get, you know, some medals for, you know, pushing the button. And, and, and they have no concept, no inkling that they're murderers. They're, they're killing you know, most of the time, I would say 99.9% .9 of the time, they're killing innocent men, women, and children. Yeah, because they're not in contact with them. They don't realize it. You know, they don't see the body parts and smell the stench of death. The longer it's around, the worse it is. Ask anybody who's been there. Yeah, I mean, it's it's just heartbreaking to see this happening. And... You know, th this bad enough when this it, it does happen to troops that are on the field because, you know, they, they get post-traumatic stress syndrome. They get sent into tour after tour after tour. They get dehumanized. They get turned into sociopaths and psychopaths, killing machines. But to have it done at this level where people just think, oh, it's no big deal. I, I, I go to work. You know, I fly drones around. And occasionally, you know, my, my uh, you know, the officer in charge, you know, he tells me, hey, target this uh this house or such and such or these coordinates and uh, push a button. And, and then I go home and uh, call it a day. I mean, it's just people are, I mean, it's just very, very disturbing the direction we're going with all this because <laughs> eventually there is going to be a reckoning. <clears throat> and it's not going to be good either. Not at all. But uh, as soon as the election's over, if you think you get pressure now, It'll be unbelievable. Yeah, I mean, either way, it, it in my opinion, it, it doesn't matter if it's Obama for another four years or, or President Romney. or I mean, I don't think it's going to be the other two guys, but you never know. It, it's just going to continue going in the same course, in the same exact direction that it's been for, you know, too long now. Oh, no, it's going to get worse. These people are not going to be able to handle in America. No, it's it's... It's getting worse with each passing week now. I mean, especially with this bill, we'll go back to it, uh, H.R. 347. And there's also a companion, as always, in the Senate, S. 1794, which is it's known as the Federal Restric Restricted Buildings and Grounds Improvement Act. And they're, they're coming after our First Amendment. They see all these people protesting, of course, the Ron Paul movement, the Tea Party movement, the Occupy movement. And they realize that a lot of the American people are not happy. They, they, they're they getting fed up, and they're hitting the streets, and they're going to come after us for it. I mean, you've seen it happen over the past couple of months now. You've seen it at, what, uh, WTO in Seattle in 2000, at, uh, what, G20 in Pittsburgh a couple of years ago, at the uh, both the Republican and Democrat conventions in 2008. And, of course, the same thing is going to happen in uh, the fall. And, uh, well, another example, Bob, what G20 was oh, scheduled to happen in Chicago, and at the last second, they moved it to Camp David. They probably uh, said we don't want to have any riots in uh, Chicago, so that's uh, probably the reason why. Yeah, yeah, it's probably just a PR move because it's an election year. They, they don't want to make the president look bad, and they want to give this illusion that he's still liked by people. And if they had it in Chicago, his quote-unquote hometown, and it got really nasty, and you had a number, of, and, and a whole bunch of people were planning on going to Chicago to, proto to protest G8. I mean, it was going to get out of hand. It was going to be like uh, what happened in Pittsburgh all over again. Probably. It's amazing that we have to dwell upon this. But, I mean, these are the situations which we have been presented with. I mean, we've got to discuss them. I mean, you know, you get all this haywire stuff going on. A uh, woman's doing her nails on the plane, and they hold her. TSA holds her for 10 hours. Uh, you get a woman who had a uh, device to pump breast milk. They make her do a demonstration for them. I mean, what kind of depraved minds are we dealing with? I'll tell you one thing. Law enforcement's one thing. But Homeland Security and TSA is another. And uh, no one's going to hesitate to pull the trigger on those people. Yeah, I mean, it's just despite all the people that have been speaking out against what the TSA has been doing with the pro porno scanners, the groping of men, women, <clears throat> senior citizens, children at airports, 
it's getting worse and worse. Just like you know, several examples you just cited, Bob. When is this going to stop? And unfortunately, I th- I think that it's going to get way worse. And you're going to get to some people who aren't going to exactly like the fact that you have some weird looking, you know, pervert agents touching their children or touching your wife or touching your grandparents. And I mean, especially with them rolling out TSA at football games and on the streets of America, sooner or later, they're going to come across the wrong people. And uh, it'll end up in violence. Very, very bad. Well, there is one thing I know for a fact, Bob, and I know this from personal experience growing up and going through public school because I've always been, you know, kind of a short guy that I always had to deal with bullies. And the bullies will will push around as many people as they want to until they come to that person like me who would be, no, you're not going to push me around and you try something, I'm going to slug you and I'm going to fight you and I'm going to kick you and I'm going to beat you to the ground till you stop. And eventually... The TSA, the DHS, and all these stormtroopers who are going along with this in law enforcement, eventually they're going to come across one individual or a group of individuals that are going to be like, no, I don't think so, and then it's going to escalate. Then you're going to see a domino effect. And they're going to say, here's my gun, where's yours? <laughs> Incidentally, we don't take prisoners. You thought you had a good job. You did. It's over. And a, a lot of people, and I realize that a lot of people in the TSA, they're not all bad guys. They're taking these jobs because there's nothing else out there, because, you know, the factories, the industries have dried up and been shipped overseas. I realize that they're trying to put food on the table. But, big but here, when the time comes when people are going to have to choose between liberty and tyranny, when we get to that crossing point, and I think it's coming very, very soon, if not this year, most likely next year, they're going to have to make that decision. They're going to decide, you know, right there, once and for all, do they stand for the Constitution and for the people, or are they going to stand for their tyrannical masters? And if they make that decision, if they, if they choose that side, Bob, there will be no forgiveness. It's a tough situation. Places like uh, California would be an absolute zoo. I lived there for many years, and I wouldn't want to live there now. I mean, almost every single big city across the country, I would want to be nowhere near them when this scenario falls out, especially cities like Chicago and New York that are very anti-gun, anti-castle law, anti-Second Amendment, anti-self-defense. You're going to be in serious trouble, especially since, you know, there's hardly anywhere to grow any food or be self-sustaining. Or move off that island, Manhattan, the Bronx. Queens. I mean, like a zoo. It's like a zoo now. I've been there many, many times. I used to live in New York at one time. But that was long before today's problems. Yeah, I mean, the five boroughs is definitely not a place I'd want to be living once this happens, Bob, or any other place. And it's sad because, you know, so many people are raised now, and I have two little sisters. You know, I love them to death. You know, they're both in college, and they love city life. These people are being programmed to believe, oh, you got to live in the city. Oh, if you don't live in the city, you're not living. And what they don't realize is all these people are falling into a trap. They want you to live in the city. They want you to be in the city. They want you to be out of the country because they can, you know, put up the roadblocks and they can lock you in. Escape from New York. Luke Pishkin. Did you see that one? Oh, yeah. Kurt Russell. Great movie. It is, and it's it's very telling. I mean, it's amazing how many of these classic films like Escape from New York, Soylent Green, and others are basically telling you exactly what's coming our way. And these films are from the, the 70s, the 80s, and it's it's very eye-opening. Red Dawn. Oh, definitely. Speaking of Red Dawn, did you hear about the, the remake to Red Dawn? How originally they, 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 they filmed it, and... They, they shot it, and they, they set the enemy, Bob, to be China. And now, apparently, after MGM went under, you know, they, you know they, all the films and projects they were working on, they redistributed them to new companies. And they went in, 
post-production, they spent a couple million dollars on this, and I think they're planning on releasing the remake to Red Dawn this year. And instead of China being the enemy, Bob, now they have North Korea as the enemy. <laughs> I mean, how do you like those apples? Anything for money, never mind the facts. North Korea couldn't beat up a windbag. Sure, they got atomic weapons, but um, they're not in a very good position logistically. They, they'd have to get help. I've had this theory well, that's for interesting. a while. Mm -hmm. It is, because I mean, the original script and the, sh the original film, the way it was shot, was having China as the enemy. They went in digitally with you know CGI and you know special effects, and they changed it all from China to North Korea. And I, I find it very fascinating that they would do that. And I mean, I could be completely wrong about this, Bob, and you, you're more well known about all this than I am. But isn't North Korea itself nothing more than just a proxy, a puppet to the communist Chinese? Yeah, but I think the U.S. controls them. I think they use them when they need them. I mean, that, that definitely makes a lot of sense because <laughs> they've had troops in that country since the armistice, since the end of the uh, Korean War. And they continue to you know, prop up South Korea, uh, their government. And without an enemy, well, I mean, they, they couldn't keep the, you know, those in the South Korean government in power. But it is pretty fascinating, though, Bob, how you know, we, we tend to have this habit of creating our own enemies. You know, most of the time they're fictional. You go back and you look at what we did to Iran. We basically turned Iran into an enemy, and eventually we turned Iraq into an enemy. And we, you know, we turned the Mujahideen, which became Al-Qaeda, into an enemy, and then Libya <laughs> into an enemy, and just to justify this police state uh, and this war machine. Well, in June 2003, they passed the point of no return. And they got to go for it all, and that's what we're facing. Yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right about that. I mean... We've been past that point for a very, very long time now. And it's it's going to end one way or the other. It's either going to end eventually with us turning things around, taking the power back, and holding these criminals accountable for their crimes, or it's it's going to end, I think, in, in utter death and devastation. Well, it's simply because people won't listen. And... Uh all we can do is what we can do. Yeah, I think the uh, the best thing that could happen to the United States after the next election is, you know, conflict within the country and the military uh, staging a coup. I mean, that is a very real possibility, Bob. That would not surprise me, especially with the way that the military was acting towards the Congress yesterday. It would not surprise me if there were certain elements in the Pentagon and the military brass who thought, well, you know what, the, and I, this is, you know, looking at it from a, a you know, a best case scenario <laughs> is that, hey, you know, the government's gotten out of control. They're no longer following the Constitution. It's time to take them out. However, Bob, we have seen time and time again when in a devil, you know, scenario, the military comes in, they take over, and we end up with something far worse. Well, in this case, I don't think that'll happen. I talk to these people frequently. And they're good people. And most of law enforcement is, too. But the problem uh, is that, you know, the leadership says, well, you got to do what the federal government says. And that's not true, and that's wrong. And, and that's the big part of the issue. I mean, I mean, I think we talked about this a week or so ago, Bob. It, it wasn't – it's not really the – I mean, I'll use this as an example. What happened in, in uh, New York with the uh, occupiers, how they were being arrested and, and beaten and tased – it, I mean, the, the, the blue shirts were sawn as the bad guys, but it wasn't the blue shirts making the call. They were just following orders. Behind them, you had the white shirts, the lieutenants, the captains, the bosses. They're the ones who are calling the shots and those above them. That's right. And they're being told by Wall Street and banking, and this is what you're going to do. And you know something? If, if this trespass bill actually passes the House and the Senate, and unfortunately it most likely will because, well, as you and I both know, Bob, these police state laws always have the 
miracle, the dark miracle of passing <laughs> these supposed uh, partisan uh, governments we have, uh, the House, the Senate, and it'll get signed by the president, and it's going to make protesting way more difficult than it already has been in this country, and a lot more people are going to get arrested for it. You're right about that. And it's, you know, it's just sad, Bob, because you see it coming. Most of these people have been very peaceful, and any provocateuring that has happened, any shenanigans, usually turns out to be some sort of double agent working for the police or various other federal agencies, and sooner or later, there's going to be a protest in the not-too-distant future where it's going to get violent, and some of these protesters are going to show up armed, and when you know, the, the stormtroopers march in and do what they usually do, you know, cordon them off, you know, fire tear gas and sound cannons and pepper spray and tase them. Eventually, you're going to see, you know, live rounds being used. That's right. And helicopters falling out of the sky. Yeah, it's just sad because I, I, I really never thought that it would come to this. I mean, I always believed in the the First Amendment, the, the right to freedom of speech, freedom of assembly. Even if I completely disagree with your point of view, I've always respected people's right to speak against the government or against whoever they want to. I'm not a fan of PETA, but they have a right to protest. They have a right to speak their mind. And unfortunately, we live in a government now that no longer shares that point of view. And unfortunately, it's only going to lead to conflict in my opinion bob we got about a minute left how can people get the international forecaster well the forecast is about business finance economic social and political issues all over the world we publish on wednesdays and saturdays by email usually runs around 35 or 40 pages each time we have a hard copy that goes out twice a month for those who are not on the internet and everything that you need to know every week is in that publication you can get a free introductory copy by going to the internationalforecaster.com the international f o r e c a s t e r.com you can also go to www.intforecaster.com intforecaster.com for those of you who would like to ask a question we answer everyone or get a copy of either publication, or if you'd like to get a copy of our latest report on gold and silver shares, email us, and that address is bob, B-O-B, at I-N-T-F-O-R-E-C-A-S-T-E-R dot com, com, bob at intforecaster dot com. And for those of you who would like to call toll-free, that number is 877-479-479. 8178 877-479-8178. You can get a free copy there. And for those of you who want to become subscribers, that's the place to go to because they have an offer there of a free one-year subscription. For those who, who are interested in the special offer that they have, which I think is terrific and you should take advantage of. You should absolutely take advantage of that deal. Bob, thank you so much for joining us this week. I will talk to you next week, sir. You got it. Bye-bye, everyone.